You're watching an RH Reality Check production brought to you by rhrealitycheck.org. A national strategy on HIV AIDS is crucially important in our fight against this terrible disease. As you know, there are more than a million Americans who are living with HIV, and every year more than 56,000 Americans become HIV infected. And we know that the disease has taken a terrible toll, especially on minority communities in the United States. A strategy would help us to clarify our vision for HIV prevention in the United States and for treatment and care of this disease in this country. It would help us to articulate very clear goals for what we're trying to achieve with our efforts. It will help us to better coordinate both across federal agencies and between federal agencies and other sectors of society which have a key role to play in preventing, controlling HIV AIDS. So a national strategy is a crucial element if, in our fight against this disease. Over the past year, CDC has released new data on the prevalence of HIV. That's the number of people living with HIV. And these new data really provide us with the clearest insight into the, the, the evolution of the epidemic. So some of the things we know, for example, is the severe and disproportionate disease burden among African Americans. As you know, African Americans account for about 13% of the population, yet they account for nearly half of all the prevalent HIV infections and nearly half of the new HIV infections which are occurring. When you look by gender, we see this evidence of this disproportionate burden of disease even more stark among African Americans. And I'll start with women and what we're seeing with women. Although women account for a smaller proportion of the total numbers of new infections which are occurring in the United States, African American women account for the majority of new HIV infections which occur in women every year. We know that most of these women are becoming infected through heterosexual intercourse, although a smaller proportion are becoming infected through injecting drug, user, injecting drug use. We also know that we're seeing an evolution of the epidemic in terms of the geographic location of where the epidemic is really taking root. In the early part of the epidemic, in the early 1980s and early 1990s, we saw infections occurring predominantly on the eastern and western seaboard, predominantly among men who have sex with men. Today with the evolution of the epidemic and more women becoming infected, we're seeing higher numbers of African-American women becoming infected, especially in the southeastern parts of the United States where we tend to have far more African-American men and women. The reality is that too many new infections are occurring in young African-American and young Hispanic men who sex with men. In fact, more than 50% of all infections occurring among MSM today are occurring among minority MSM. So we see again this evidence of this disproportionate and severe burden of disease occurring in this population group. The most important thing to state is, is that it's not the color of our skin that places us at highest risk of acquiring HIV or STDs. It's not the fact that I might be of African heritage or ethnicity which might place me at a higher, higher risk of acquiring any infectious disease. But we know that there are individual level factors, but there are also societal factors which drive one's risk of acquiring the disease. So for example, at the individual level, we know that if you have higher numbers of sexual partners, if you're injecting drug use, if you're not practicing safer sex cons constantly and consistently and correctly, then that's going to raise your risk as an individual of acquiring an STD or acquiring HIV. Now at the community level, there are factors which may place some communities at greater risk than others. For example, among the African American community, we know that there are concerns about the high rates of incarceration, especially among African American men. And we're seeing similar trends of high degrees of incarceration among Hispanic populations as well. We know that factors such as homophobia, discrimination, ignorance around HIV are perhaps more prevalent, especially among minority communities. And this ignorance, this discrimination, this fear 
can have an impact both on reducing the uptake of effective prevention services or ensure that people who may be living with the disease are fearful of being identified or seeking the social support t or talking about their disease openly and honestly. Well, the majority of new infections which are occurring among women um, are infections which are acquired from a partner, a heterosexual partner, who is HIV infected. So there are a number of things that might be going on here. First of all, it could be, uh, it may be driven by the fact that a significant proportion of HIV positive individuals are not aware of their HIV status. CDC estimates that about one in five individuals who are HIV positive do not know that they're HIV positive and may be unwittingly or unknowingly transmitting the infection to others. We also know that among minority communities, the proportion of undiagnosed HIV infection is even higher. So if you think of Latino populations or African American populations, a higher proportion of people living with HIV may not be aware of their status and therefore be transmitting the disease. And heterosexual transmission, especially from male to female, is in fact a very um, efficient way of transmission of the virus in, in instances of unprotected sexual intercourse. There are also other factors as well which may be driving the transmission between heterosexually, especially in minority communities. Remember that in many of these communities, whether African American or Latino, we do see high prevalences of some bacterial and viral sexually transmitted diseases. And these STDs act in two ways. They can both increase the acquisition, the likelihood of acquiring HIV by creating more vulnerability in the genital tract or they can, if someone is HIV infected, having an STD increases the infectiousness of that person with HIV. So that can also result in increased likelihood of transmission of HIV. This is a, a, a very interesting and distressing part of the epidemic that we're dealing with uh, in the United States today. And the reality is that HIV has always been a dynamic and moving uh, target as far as an epidemic is concerned. We have been seeing this concentration of dis the disease in the southeastern parts of the United States. In fact, this is the same region of the country where we see high rates of gonorrhea, higher rates of syphilis, and other bacterial STDs. And there are a number of factors which can explain this geographic concentration. On the one hand, it may reflect historical patterns of um, underfunding and in healthcare and investments, underfunding in prevention services within the southeastern parts of the United States. It may also reflect realities of living in the southern parts of the United States, both the fact that more people may live in rural parts of the, of the, of the southern states and therefore have poor access to effective treatment and care services or poor access to effective prevention services. Being in the southeastern parts of the country as well also have unique uh, cultural responses to HIV AIDS, um, as well as to cultural responses to the factors which may be driving the epidemic. So we know, for example, that issues such as stigma, discrimination, and homophobia, these are factors which are driving the epidemic all over the country, may be particularly challenging in the southeastern parts of the country. We know that currently, of all the money spent on HIV in the United States, approximately 4% of federal spending is actually targeted towards prevention, whereas the rest of that spending goes towards research, treatment, uh, linkage to care, and effective care services for people living with HIV. We need to both articulate the need for and the benefits of prevention. We need to articulate clearly the opportunities which exist for scaling up and for enhancing our prevention activities. And we also need to be very clear in what prevention achieves. We know prevention works. And what we now need to be focusing on is ways in which we can think about and use the most effective prevention strategies, the ways in which we can scale up the effective prevention strategies to have a real impact on bringing an end to this disease.